Not many stories are as twisted as that of the Angel of Slaughter. Having to overcome a sense of abandonment and being forced to endure physical and mental trauma from a young age, we're going to look at the events up to Cold Steel 3 which were key in shaping the character we meet in Trails in the Sky. This is the story of Ren. Born into a young merchant's family, Ren Hayworth is first seen on the run with her parents, attempting to avoid the attention of the Mafia, who are chasing her father at the behest of creditors. Due to the rapid growth of Crossbell, Harold Hayworth was forced to run a dishonest business in order to stay afloat, which inevitably led to a high level of leverage. When the debt became unsustainable, the family were forced to flee to Calvert, where a young Wren was left in the care of an old friend, at which time her parents promised they would come back for her when everything had settled down. This promise was kept, and the Hayworths did indeed come back to Calvert to take back their child. However, what they found upon their return reciprocated their worst fears. Not only had the house been destroyed by arsonists, but their precious daughter was nowhere to be found and in the minds of the Hayworths, they were forced to accept that their only child had passed on. Yet, in a sick twist, the gods had not forsaken Ren to death. Instead, she was subjected to a worse fate. Far worse. During the time Ren was in Calvert, a large series of kidnappings were taking place, and unfortunately for the young Ren, she was one of the victims taken by the maniacal DG cult. Took into the Altair Lodge in Calvert, Ren was subject to numerous experiments that sought to enhance her intellect, but experimentation doesn't come without a price, and the cult needed some way to finance their project. Seeking to gain the favour of high wealth individuals, Ren was loaned to Paradise, a brothel that subjected children to the worst treatment imaginable. During her time at the brothel, despite being in a hapless situation, she at least had the company of four friends who would regularly go down for clients in Ren's stead leaving her in comfort away from the abuse that they were subject to. As weeks passed, her friends began to disappear one after the other, until eventually Ren was left alone. Now, one might think that Ren's friends simply succumbed to their treatment at the hands of the brothel's clients, but the actual reality was far more dark than it initially appears. The sad truth is that Ren had in fact been down to visit the clients of the brothel many times before, and she was particularly gifted at giving her customers what they wanted, whether it would be a cool boy or a mature girl. As the abuse she suffered continued, she created a psychological barrier in the form of friends with differing personalities to protect her own sanity, but as the physical harm became worse, this shield started to crack until Ren was finally on the brink of breaking completely, and her only solace was a medicine that slowly ate away at her psyche. This continued for half a year. Finally nearing death's door, Ren hears the telltale signs of a slaughter taking place in the brothel, as two young enforcers, a boy with black hair and a man with a sword forged through divergent laws, find the battered Ren hanging onto her life. Noticing the crosses of self-mutilation upon her body, the enforcers take Ren into the Society of Ouroboros, where she is eventually trained up and conditioned by George Weissman to become Enforcer Number 15, the Angel of Slaughter. Shortly after Ren's inauguration into Ouroboros, the 13 Factories network under the supervision of the 6th Anguis Novartis began a project noted as the Gordius Class Tactical Archaism Development Plan, which had the aim of creating a state-of-the-art Gordius Class Archaism that would inherit the DNA of all previous models, but also employed a more advanced control system. In particular, Novartis wanted the Archaism to be accessible all over the continent, with engines that would allow it to operate for several years before requiring a resupply. The control system also allowed the Archaism to communicate with its operator via their central nervous system, allowing for more flexibility in combat and the ability to develop its own AI so as to act more autonomously for the benefits of its operator. But this required a candidate who was able to communicate with the machine. Many subjects were chosen and failed the experiments, with a sizable number experiencing comas, cardiac arrest or mental breakdowns. After a time, Ouroboros decided to halt production of the project, stating that there was a question regarding the stability of the control system. 
They felt that they had to not only fine-tune the archaism, but also to more carefully pick the test subjects. After the archaism was confiscated from the Rosenberg doll studio and taken away from its creator, Jörg Rosenberg, Novartis felt he had finally found the perfect candidate to take the test, and wasted no time in conducting a four-phased experiment. When all was said and done, test subject R3 was successful in syncing with the Gordius class archaism, experiencing only minor side effects. And thus, a very young Wren was bonded to her Goliath protector, Patermater. Upon being taken in by the society, Wren developed a strong friendship with her saviours, Luve and Joshua, and would frequently join them in missions. Though her skill and bloodthirsty nature were often frightening, she still maintained the mannerisms of a little girl, choosing to take on the alias of a young lady. With Joshua and Luve, she would often watch them train, and give them refreshments as part of her tea party she often liked to embellish in. However, this happiness would not last long, as Joshua was eventually sent off on a special mission, and with one of her closest playmates gone, Wren found herself lonely and bored. At this time, she decided to make her way to her hometown, where she found a violet-haired man with his wife and young child. To Wren, it was clear who she had just found. Upon hearing their conversation together, in particular their comments about the child they had lost before, Wren started to feel that she meant nothing to these two people who were supposed to be her real parents. Yet, before she could escalate the matter, Luve came to offer some words of support, which seemed to get through to Ren, as she found herself joyously reminiscing on the people who she deemed her true parents and friends. But it wasn't long till she started to miss Joshua once again, and after a while, Luve also disappeared on his own mission. Though Ren was indeed bored once again, she thought she had finally found something that would amuse her for the time being, none other than the first stage of the Grand Master's ultimate scheme, the Gospel Plan. With Alan Richard's coup thwarted, the people of Grand Cell and Lebel felt that peace had finally returned to the land, when, in reality, this was just the first step of a much more grand design. Gathering various enforcers together, Weissman explained the second phase of the Gospel plan, to utilise black orbments known as Gospels around various locations in Lebel. Each enforcer was given an orbment to work with, but how they got the results was completely up to their own discretion. Ren felt that the Gospel presented a great chance for some pranks, and readily accepted her role in the plan. Before departing to Ruin, Ren again asked Luve if Joshua was due to return to the society, at which point Weissman interfered, telling her the real reason why Joshua would likely never come back to Ouroboros. Simply giving the name Estelle to the young enforcer meant that she now had a target for elimination, as she felt that by erasing this Estelle, Joshua would have no more reason to remain away from the society. With her resolve set, Ren made her way to Ruin. It's at the Letton Air checkpoint where a violet-haired girl and her family are found observing the waterfall. To any onlooker, it appears to be the picture-perfect representation of the happy family, a doting father, a loving mother, and an energetic child. Upon exchanging pleasantries, Ren asks Estelle if she would be willing to play at a later time, should they meet again. With Estelle readily agreeing, Ren and her parents depart to another area, while Estelle continues her journey. With their errands complete in Zace, the army requests the support of the Braces in Grand Cell. Estelle and company make their way to the capsule, and immediately enter the Grand Cell guild branch to find out the details. Upon asking for details of the request, they find that the army are due to send an official to fill them in, as they don't want to discuss the details over the phone. It's not long before the branch gets a call directly from the Air Royal Villa, where a diplomatic meeting will be held in the near future. It appears that the staff have misplaced the child, and they are also struggling to find her parents, at which point they ask the Bracers for assistance. At the Air Royal Villa, after searching the various glamorous halls and gilded decorations, the group stumble upon a young girl beneath the counter, who they instantly recognise as the girl they met at Air Letton. Her astute nature is surprising to all, as Ren concedes that the game of hide and seek she started was due to her knowledge of Estelle and the other braces coming to the capital, not to mention her ability to judge the innate strength of Philip as he walked by near the Grand Cell gates. A very strange skill for a child, but possibly she was just a very intelligent one. What's more surprising, however, is the information regarding her parents, who have since departed on business, leaving their 11-year-old daughter alone. 
Due to the seemingly careless nature of the mother and father, the Bracers take Ren back to the guild for safety. It's only natural that a pair of young girls would get along well, so Tita is left behind with Ren to go on a shopping trip, while the other Bracers conduct their investigation to find the Hayworths. Upon finding all the information that can be gathered, the group regathers for an evening of festivities at the behest of Olivier. After drinking the night away, in the case of some, the group retires for the evening, with Estelle and Ren sharing a room for the night. And despite being exhausted, the two exchange many a pleasantry, as Ren playfully drags more and more out of Estelle, even finding out information about a boy named Joshua. To Estelle, it was just the curious nature of a little girl, but to Ren, this was something far more premeditated. The next day arrives, and as the sun blares in the clear sky, the Bracers make their way to the Guild Branch to collect their payment from the army. Discussing the happenings around Ground Cell, however, are trying on a child's patience, and unbeknownst to the group, their violet-haired protectee sneaks away for some more fun. Eventually, Ren reunites with the group outside the airport, where after a quick scolding from Estelle and walking back to the guild, passes a letter to the bracer that she received while in hiding. A letter from a boy who matched the description of a certain Joshua Bright. Filled with hope, Estelle rushes to the Goreng Gate to finally meet again with her brother. That night, after a diversion attack near the Erbril Villa, the pressure surrounding Grand Cell finally released like a torrent as the Bracers are invited to a tea party somewhere in the city. Under the darkness, the coup materialises at Grand Cell Port, where the aid of former Colonel Richard, Canone, reveals her plan to overthrow Grand Cell and rescue her former commander. Even more concerning is the fact that Canone holds a gospel that shuts down all orbital energy in a radius around it, revealing that she holds this as part of an experiment. However, her glee is short-lived, as Kevin utilises the Cronus Rod to nullify the Black Mechanism. After a fierce battle, the Bracers finally appear victorious, and the mastermind of the coup is now under duress. At least, that's what any sane person would think. Surely, only the most imaginative individuals would expect a child to have orchestrated everything. As Canone realises what has happened, an innocent yet chilling voice echoes from the warehouses above. There stands a girl in a white dress, overlooking the events unfold in front of her. The true puppet master, the organiser of this tea party, is finally revealed as Ren, the Angel of Slaughter and Enforcer Number 15 of Ouroboros. As Estelle tries to wrap her head around everything, Ren delivers all answers in a cold and direct manner, the truth of her parents, the use of the sleeping drugs, the forging of letters, and of course, the reveal of her true parent, Patermater. With the experiment complete, Ren takes the gospel back, but before leaving, she expresses her amusement at Estelle. She came to Grand Cell to simply gut the bracer from the start, but after everything, she expressed a sense of forgiveness, not out of empathy, but more out of pity and amusement. With that, she and Patermata disappear into the void above. With the Gospel experiments complete, the Chosen Enforcers gathered once again to begin Phase 3. As the group discussed their successes and relayed the results to Weissman, Ren expressed her fondness of Estelle, despite what the Professor had told her before. The ever-scheming Weissman saw this as an opportunity. Why not bring the sheep to the lair of the wolves? Why not invite the noble-minded Estelle to join Ouroboros? With the proposition brought forward, Ren found herself liking the idea feeling that it fulfilled two desires of her own, to attain a new playmate and to bring Joshua back to the society. Happily going along with the Professor's plan, Ren awaits patiently for the arrival of Estelle as the Bracer overcomes various trials before finally encountering several doll forms of Joshua. With the imitations decimated, a subtle click of the fingers is heard from the shadows, which releases a miasma of gas that incapacitates the Bracer allowing Luve to carry Estelle to the Glorious, the flagship of Ouroboros. Aboard the airship, Ren waits in amusement as a groggy Estelle awakens. With the Bracer now conscious, Ren is tasked with leading Estelle to the inner sanctum where the Anguis resides. 
As the enforcers and vicemen disclose the aims of the society, an impatient Wren lets her eagerness overtake her and implores the invitation to be given, at which time Estelle is taken back to her quarters to think the decision over. Unfortunately for Wren, the answer would not be what she hoped for, as Estelle's resolve and the help of Joshua allow her to escape. With the second phase in motion to bring the Liber Arc back to the world, Wren awaits atop the Amble Tower to release the seal, when she is finally encountered by Estelle and, to her surprise, Joshua. Despite showing initial glee, it quickly turns to rage, as Estelle starts to dig into Wren's persona. In particular, the idea that the society, her new family, are wrong. This is something that Wren has never experienced before, an actual elder who will discipline her should she stray from a moral path. The society up to this point have allowed her complete freedom as a mandate of being an enforcer, so having someone question that, especially someone who she believes is inferior to her, causes the angel to snap into a demon. The fun-loving prankster known as Wren, from this point, truly embodies her enforcer title. It becomes clear to Estelle in particular that Wren has been conditioned far more intricately than she initially thought, with the enforcer expressing that her true happiness lies in the suffering of others. To the inside, Wren believes herself to be an angel, whereas to those outside, many might call these the mannerisms of a sociopath, something that Estelle finds as a difficult reality to swallow. It becomes obvious very quickly why Wren defends the society with such vigour. How dare someone question the people who took you in, who taught you about life, who gave you real friends and real parents? How could this group, who has given you everything, possibly be in the wrong. It's a dilemma that any rational adult would struggle with, let alone an 11 year old child, and despite her clear intelligence, Wren finds Estelle's words cuts her deeper than any wound she has ever inflicted with her scythe. And what happens when someone hurts you? You get your mum and dad to beat them up. Before Patermater can obliterate the group however, the gospel ceases to react, meaning that the seal at Amble Tower has now been released. With her role complete for now, Wren shows restraint in letting the group live as she rides Patermater back to the Glorious. With the second seal finally released, the society brings the Liber Arc back to the world, the floating city of the ancient Zemurians. Suspended above Valeria Lake, Weissman wastes no time in making his way to the central axis pillar, the unit that distributes power around the floating city in order to find the all-powerful Oriel. To prevent the interference of outside forces, the enforcers involved with the Gospel Plan are stationed at various levels of the pillar, acting as a barrier to anyone who tries to progress. Wren takes her place on the fourth level and waits for the inevitable encounter. Despite feeling anger at Estelle from what was said at Amble Tower, Wren offers an ultimatum to the group to simply take back what was said before and in return, Wren would fly away and let them pass. For Wren, the answer is simple. And for Estelle as well, her response is immediate. But it's not the answer that Wren was expecting. As Estelle reaffirms her stance on Wren's position in Ouroboros, the Enforcer finally succumbs to her bloodlust, calling Patermater and attacking the group with full force. Somehow, the Enforcer and Archaism are defeated after a long and drawn out battle, which sees Patermater lose the use of its right leg. With the realisation that she is now defeated, Wren concedes and allows Estelle to deactivate the barrier to the upper levels. Yet, despite the importance of stopping Weissman, Estelle makes it clear that her sole priority at this point in time is Wren herself. Up until this point in her life, Wren believes that all those who inflict pain upon her are the lowest of beings, people who deserve to suffer as she suffered all those years ago, 
and the discipline she receives from Estelle brings back those tragic memories, albeit briefly, as Estelle explains that she is not like the people who hurt Ren in the past. In Estelle's embrace, Ren starts to feel confusion at this intimate, warm sensation, this feeling of finally having someone care for you, and the fact that there are different kinds of hurt. Hurts that are born of a malicious source, and hurts that are given to you as a lesson out of love. Being the first time that Ren has experienced the latter, her mind starts to feel fuzzy and confused, as her jovial appearance melts away to reveal a vulnerable child. With her mind spinning, Ren decides that she has to go home, and leaves Estelle and Joshua atop the axis pillar, explaining that she has to find her own answers for the time being. With this, she departs the Liber arc, and disappears into the sky. As the situation in Labelle quiets down, a cacophony of rain sounds in the trees above, as Ren and Paytomato rest near the side of the road. Through rational deduction, one would assume that she returned to the society after the events in Labelle, However, it appears that Ren feels her true answers lie in the small autonomous state of Crossbell. With the coordinates set, Patermater and Ren continue their journey. A few months after the events surrounding Labelle, Ren finds herself waking up in a world unlike her own, surrounded by a void of nothingness. As her eyes clear, she sees the telltale signs of people, familiar people, who know her and seem to care about her. How laughable, really, as why would anyone care about Ren? She forsook that illusion many years ago, hence, this must be a dream. Yet, through Estelle's embrace, Ren finds to her horror that this is no fantasy, and realises that she has awoken a land known as Phantasma, where many other involved parties have also gathered. As the situation is explained to her, her own suspicions are also confirmed as Joshua confirms that the Bracer duo have been following Ren for some months now, and have made their way into Crossbell as things stand. For the Enforcer, she comes to the conclusion that this is all a facade, a ruse under an ulterior motive to get information on Ouroboros out of her. Feeling that she has found the answer, the Angel of Slaughter draws her scythe to engage the group, until a brave Tita steps up to her and makes her realise the folly of her mindset. With the child's tears quelling the burning fire within Ren, she decides to help the group out of respect for Tita. As the group progresses to the later areas of the dream world, they finally encounter the true culprit for the phenomenon, and upon defeating it, the group returns to the waking world. As more of the party depart back to the Samuria, Analeis and Tita in particular gives some food for thought to Ren before making the leap, making it apparent that they hope she comes back to La Belle, with Estelle and Joshua by her side. To Ren, this represents a real feeling of sadness and loneliness as she has to face the reality that the people she has grown fond of are now disappearing before her eyes. Yet, despite her sadness, Estelle explains to her that this is simply a part of life, and reaffirms to Ren that she and Joshua would chase her to the ends of the earth to bring her back. In particular, they finally reveal what they intended to ask all those months prior, the desire to make Ren a part of their family, something that the child has never truly experienced before. Still struggling with the idea that people care for her, but also feeling conflicted in that she simply wants to be in a loving family, Ren runs away as fast as she can into the light, returning to the waking world with the words of Joshua and Estelle still echoing in her mind. In the land of Crossbell, a group of young detectives, the special support section, discover a lonely manor in the mountains. Outside of the howling of the wind and the cawing of crows, the house appears to be closed off to the public, a fact made clear by the sign on the outside wall. As the SSS contemplate the next move, a young girl's voice echoes nearby, as a violet-haired girl in a white dress explains to them that her grandfather is away. They ask her some questions regarding wolves in the area, at which points the child becomes intrigued. After introducing herself as Ren, she is asked to take refuge in the house for the time being as a matter of security, something that the child expresses displeasure at, but still complies with. Giving a farewell to the SSS, the gates grind open as she makes her way inside. Any normal child would heed the warnings of their elders, but not Ren as her curiosity gets the better of her. Watching the situation unfold, she finds herself rooting for the SSS atop a nearby mountain peak, 
where she finds herself discovered by the A-rank bracer and sword saint of wind, Arios McLean. Though Arios is aware of the mannerisms of Ren, in particular her joy of setting up tea parties, Ren discloses that she has no intention of causing harm in Crossbell, and is simply in the state for her own personal reasons, of which she remains silent, for now. With that, she takes her leave for the evening. Eventually, Lloyd Bannings finds himself on the track of a missing person, Colin, the child of the Hayworths. While searching for clues, he stumbles upon Wren in the back alleys, who offers her assistance to the junior detective. Now, one might wonder why a child wishes to help out in a situation like this, but Lloyd simply accepts the help graciously. As they continue to make their way around the city, Lloyd finds himself stunned by the child's amazing deductive skills. Even more surprising is her ability to operate the terminal at the SSS HQ with little to no effort, finding the team's next lead. As they follow the breadcrumbs, they finally find their target as the young Hayworth wanders aimlessly along the highway. It's a miracle that the child has been unharmed for so long. That is, until some feral assailants descend from the mountains and surround him. With the situation dire, Ren draws her scythe and intercepts the wolves before they can attack leaving the rest to the special support section. The danger finally avoided, Ren finds herself still shielding a frightened Colin. For the boy, the experience was harrowing, but for Ren, she has ultimately saved what she feels has replaced her all those years prior. Colin isn't some simple lost child. He is in fact the biological brother of Ren, a brother that Ren was determined not to save, until the point where his life was threatened. Struggling to understand why she felt compelled to act, Ren can't help but break down in tears as the group returns to the SSS for the arrival of the Hayworths. Hiding herself from the pair in a closet, the Hayworths show their gratitude to the SSS for bringing their child back to them. For a while, they felt their Colin had suffered the same fate as their previous child, an incident that they still felt immense guilt for. As the Hayworths pour out their past to the SSS, an onlooking Wren starts to feel tears stream down her face as she realises the truth of everything, that her family never abandoned her as she originally thought, and that they still feel remorse for everything that happened prior, feeling that their mistakes doomed her to death. With Colin, they hope to never make the same missteps, stating that the grief they still feel to this day is reason enough to keep going forward, and that they thank their late daughter, their guardian angel even, for leading them to Colin in the end. As the Hayworths leave, Wren comes out of hiding, and though this moment has provided closure to her, she still can't help but feel that the moment is bittersweet, as in reality she has to stay away from her parents for their own safety, and her brothers. With this, one of her answers has finally been found. For now, Wren takes solace, and observes. Soon after, as an incident in Crossbell reaches a critical point, the SSS discover the true culprit behind the involvement of the crisis and seek to put an end to the happenings across the state by confronting him in St. Ursula Hospital. It's here that they find some files laid out for them that detail all the events that have been happening undercover over the present time period and the past. In particular, they discover the pictures of various children and their experimental results, and one of them looks eerily familiar. Before the SSS can process the revelation, a voice can be heard coming near the window, where Ren is sitting on the pane. With the help of the SSS, she now had all the information she needed to get her revenge, vengeance on the one who was the root of so much of her suffering. With Patermater now repaired, she flies off to find the head of the DG cult, Joaquin Gunter, and bring him to her own sense of justice. As the cult's location is steadily confirmed, the SSS, Estelle and Joshua fight their way to the depths where the Inner Sanctuary and Gunter are waiting. Though they're able to defeat the Gnosis-infused Joaquin, he finally starts to lose control of his demonification and manages to trap the Six in snares. However, before their fates are sealed, Ren, along with Patermater, unleash a barrage of fire on the priest, ultimately giving the group the assistance they needed to defeat the cult head. With the crisis averted and her final purpose for being in Crossbell fulfilled, Ren decides that now is the time to leave, never to be seen again. At least, this is what the rational side of Ren feels is right. But 
Wouldn't it be better, just this once, to let your emotions guide your happiness? As Estelle and Joshua express their love for Rem, the barrier surrounding her starts to dissipate as she turns her back to avoid showing weakness. Her predictions had finally come crashing down around her as she realizes that the two bracers would never give up trying to catch her. Despite her past, despite her wrongdoings, they still see her for what she really is, a girl who yearns for a family's love. And though Ren still feels hesitant in joining the Bright family, her surrogate parent feels no qualms in making up her mind for her. As Peter Mater hands the Enforcer into the arms of Estelle, Ren finally succumbs to her desires and accepts the invitation on the table with tears of gratitude. However, though the incident of the cult has now been resolved, something far more sinister lurks in the shadows, and it's not long before the three, now back in Labelle, get an SOS message from an old friend. Coming back to Crossbell, it's clear to the three that something is clearly amiss, as a huge barrier surrounds the capital, preventing entry to any who are deemed a threat to the state. On top of this, large archaisms not dissimilar to Patermater patrol the highways blocking the advances of Erebonia and Calvert. With the situation on the west under control by Kevin Graham, the three plus Patermater engage the Aeon at the East Gate. However, with an infinite supply of power from the Septarian of Zero, Patermater is quickly overwhelmed as the three brights are forced to look on, unable to do anything. Overcome with a desire to protect her parents, Ren launches one final assault on the Aeon until she is put at the mercy of the hulking Colossus. With the Aeon ready to seal Ren's fate, Patermater makes one final attempt to save the Enforcer. Lifting the Aeon into the sky, the Archaism initiates a self-destruct sequence, taking his own life but also the enemies as well, as Ren, Estelle and Joshua can do nothing else but watch it happen. As the events in Crossbell begin to reach their climax, the various parts of a large object are found scattered around the plains, as the Telltale's familiar shape of Patermater remains motionless at the base of a cliff. With Ren by his side, Patermater can finally pass on in peace, knowing that his dear friend is now in safe hands, and knowing that he has protected what is most precious to him. With a final goodbye, he deactivates, as Ren grieves the loss of her parents. The tale of Ren Bright is a fitting redemption arc, a story of someone who has lost all hope, who, in the midst of despair, felt joy in the suffering of others. The sad reality is that she just yearned for a family of her own, but grew up believing that such a thing does not exist. Through her journey, and through the support of Estelle, Joshua, Tita, and others, she was able to find the answers she wanted, and overcome the walls that stood in her way. Ren Bright's story does not end after Crossbell. It continues beyond into the stories of Cold Steel 3 and 4, but that will be a tale for another time. For now, Ren can finally be content with what she has found.